I think what I'd like to do uh, to, to start is to begin with questions, okay, for, for Rod. We've had an hour and 15 minutes or more of Rod. Uh, I'll be on this side of the room with a mic, and Nancy, you want to stay on that side of the room with a mic? And that way you can sort of see, and then if, because you have to speak into the mic, I'm sorry, but, and, and don't forget this is going on YouTube, which means the whole world can see it. Okay, so uh, no, no, pressure. no pressure. It's just uh, if you have any hesitation about sharing something, et cetera, that you don't want the whole world to see, uh, note that in advance. So, any uh, over here? I start. Hi, thank you so much for your talk and for your uh, for what, what you brought to us today. It was really very sweet and kind and, and special. Um, I have a question about the end of life in that moment because it's very provocative in a sense. I'm wondering, the stories that you've shared and the experiences that you've had seem to be with people that have had very, what seem to be ethical lives, but what about the characters that are reprehensible as far as we determine them to be? The killers, the, you know, the terrible people in the world. Have you ever seen this type of person be carried away in this way uh, or? I, I, I have not. Um, uh, you know, Maine's pretty quiet, sedate. Um, I have, however, been in the jail dealing with some very violent people. And they're not dying, but, but they're in severe pain. So one man, he was like 6'5", 300 pounds, and extremely angry and coming at me and my staff and the police are there so you know in that situation and I just let that love flow through me and and I, I literally I felt so safe I walked up I put my hand I touched him and I said looks like you're having a bad day and this guy you know uh, he just sat down and just started crying and I put my arm around him and I said, I can help you. So if you get past that form and that fear um, and you can reach, because it's God working with you, you can reach into that person and that's what you're touching. I'm not touching the horrible person that's doing these things. I was really scared. And, um, but once that flow of love um, comes, then the fear goes away, and suddenly you know, the Course talks about the innocence within. That's what you're dealing with. And so the last thing I want to do um, is, is make the form of that ego worse. I don't want to fight with it. I don't want to make that the reality. You know, anger is never justified. And so I really have to um, stand, even in board meetings, um, going into hot family arguments where people are really upset about something, I say, big brother Christ, you step in first. And, and I honestly do that, and everything calms down. You're not dealing with that angry person. So specifically at the time of net, at death, I've not seen that. This is the best I can do by way of analogy that but it, does, it is somewhat similar, I think. I, I understand. Thank you for that. But I'm, I'd like to escalate this to a philosophical level, if possible. So, for instance, we know that according to a lot of different religions and traditions, for instance, in the Catholic faith, you'll either go to, you know, heaven or purgatory or hell. The Vedic faith, you know, you are going to come back or you have karmas to deal with and reconcile. So where does accountability come into this? In other words, if somebody's truly had a life of you know, like a reprehensible life, and they've done, they've inflicted great harm upon people. Is it just that at the end of that life, you know, God loves us regardless, or is there any accountability factor that 
people have to be aware of as they're actually going through life. Um, yeah. in, in other words, so that it's not just so, you know, ambivalent, arbitrary, kind of haphazard, and, you know, how do we make sense of it? In other words, mm -hmm. we're all trying to live very decent lives, um, but does it matter in the end? It's kind of a question that I have based well, upon this. So the story I, that I talked about with Roger, you know, um, a lot of um, bad things that we would consider bad, but at the end, he was able to break through those blocks. What do you do with Hitler? What do you do with Gandhi? We see them as a monster and a saint, but the question is, how does God see them? We created this world, not God, and God sees them as an extension of himself, as love. Um, so to me, it's what's more important is, is, is the forgiveness, and, and that is spiritual forgiveness. And God says, you're still my holy child. You're still innocent. You've done nothing wrong. We layer and layer and layer that, you know, you murdered this person, this, such a they belong in jail, no question, in my mind. Um, but the time of death, it's like that just doesn't matter anymore. Um, and the people that have been victimized and the people that, that caused the perpetrators, and the bottom line, they all become innocent children. And that's just what I see. I've never seen Christ deny anybody. So it's that much love. I can't. In our mind, I don't think we can comprehend that until you get to the spiritual level and get to see with the eyes of Christ that you are, in fact, that innocent. And it's like God's not denied anybody that I've seen. Yeah, yeah I think we should remember in the long run, in terms of A Course in Miracles, it's really a matter of guilt. I mean, guilt is the big problem, right? And, and someone who's done some things pretty perhaps all is tremen tremendous guilt. Breaking through that guilt is a, and the, the case with Roger is a perfect example of being able to break through the guilt. You know that um, I worked in prison for, for eight years, and I could just see that these were really kind of innocent people that just got themselves in really bad situations that had really kind of screwed up their lives completely. But underneath there, there was still, and that's what the Course asks us to do is to. It, with everyone is to be able to reach through and see the innocence that's still there. That, that, that the course that there's there's no one here in whom the light has gone out completely. You know the task is to be able to look in there and to find that little piece of light, that little speck. You know the course calls it a little spark. You know find that little spark and see if there's any way we can begin to bring that spark back into to life again. Otherwise, this person is really pretty miserable until this change can begin to occur. So the change has to occur. We all will get home. Even the most re reprehensible will wake up. It's, gonna be, it's hard. It's hard, hard for the ordinary individual. It's hard for you and me to wake up. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Over there. Uh, behind you, right behind you, Nancy. Thanks. This one. Hello. Push the button. Oh, yeah. I hate it when you have to push button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, in a, in a very strange sense, this is an extension of the, that question and that dialogue that you were having. Um, and, and I probably won't make that clear, but just I just want to say that so that throw it into the mix. So first of all, thank you. And in particular, I want to thank you because I don't, I'm not a doctor. Um, but the profession that I have, I work with corporate executives and I can apply what you've demonstrated here to me into, into that work. And you've, you've helped me to extend it out further, to use different, you know, the possibility of using, excuse me, I'm hitting her, of you, <laughs> using different language. And it's, and it's very gratifying to see you do what you're doing. So thank I want to thank, thank you. Thank you. Second thing, this is this is sort of a question, but it's actually a. I want to plant a seed. I, I, I'm sitting there going, man, where's he going to be? Where is he? He's in Boston. I, I want somebody to be here in, in in New York or New Jersey, 
because when I'm ready to pass, I want you at my <laughs> side. <clears throat> and and to, 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 to extend that out, where are the other doctors or the other uh, um, people who take care of people who die, you know, who transition? Where uh, can't you find them and unite and teach them and show mm. them and have them teach you so that they're, I'll look in the telephone book. <laughs> Do they still have telephone? I'll yeah. look in the yeah. telephone book and I'll, I'll find somebody that's nearby. So, so I, you know, you're one, one entity, uh, uh, one, it, you're part, you're the, you're the light and you're the light in the world in a location. And so I, I want there to be lights everywhere so everybody has that opportunity mm. that the opportunity the i think it was the first story you told because the what the opportunity is is to know that it's okay mm. to pass study the yeah. yeah study the course of miracles but, <laughs> but, 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 but uh, it's not just the course it's i don't think we're talking about a course of miracles course of miracles is the framework for that kind of conversation that you're having in here. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it's, I wouldn't limit it to Course in Miracles. Can I share something for that? Oh, thanks so much. Thanks. So that's wonderful, and you are correct. Um, hi, my name is Suzanne O'Brien, and I am a former hospice and oncology nurse who has developed a program called End of Life Doula. And End of Life Doula training is exactly, and I'm listening to you, and thank you so much for sharing, mm -hmm. We have so much parallel experiences that we have had, but I am the one that was at the bedside in the home as a hospice nurse, but now I train other people to be that person that is global. I'm training 38 people tonight on a webinar that are from all over the place. And so you can, you are one person, I am one person, but we are training, Debbie is one. Um, and we're training, it's a non-medical person that has the skill on how to care for the dying. So we will be everywhere because there's such a large number of people that are going to be that holistic need of care and love. Mm -hmm. So thank you for bringing that up. So it's yeah. called End of Life Doula. Thank you're welcome. You for what you're doing. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Um, this is kind of a technical point. When you were saying that um, the older woman, in the, I think she was 80, that died, I'm sorry, I'm being told I'm not talking loud enough. Um, the woman, the older woman that died, uh, you said um, you sat by her bedside. This may have been one of the first people, and you saw her soul or mm -hmm. her sit up. But maybe it's just the way you told the story. It seemed to be that she had already passed. Her her body was was dead, it, right? And but I thought it was interesting because it was a timing thing for me. I had no idea the soul would stay in the body, did not leave immediately. Mm -hmm. But it seemed. And could you just elaborate a little bit on the technicalities of that? How the many minutes? Yeah, how many? It's, yeah, it's three you know, minutes. How does and that work? Seconds. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um. I cut out a lot of stuff. Um, it's 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 a variable um, process. Sometimes people will will their their aura will float, maybe an inch, just just a disconnect. And a lot of times when people die, they'll they'll just it's just like sitting up, getting out of bed. You know, whatever few seconds that is. Sometimes there's a family member that's grieving so hard, they're, they kind of like hold the person down for a little bit. And you got to go over and just hold them and let them break through that wall. So, and then there's release. And, and then other times what makes it hard is people will wait for their loved ones to all, my dad did this, they all waited for us to leave and oh good, they're gone, now I can leave, you know, and they're gone. So, but usually within a minute, 
you know, that, that they'll, they'll be there. That little baby stayed there for about a minute and just like go back in. So, and that's just me, my own personal experience. I don't have any data on that. Um, but there's always that little bit of a hover time. And um, I've never seen anybody just bolt out of there. But the majority of the times when I see it, it it's, it's within a minute, something like that. There's actually a point in the course on page 346, I'm not where it says, uh, for a while the body is still seen, but not exclusively as it is here. So it's giving this, there's this transition moment which must occur, right? Can I ask one more sure. thing? If you would elaborate a little bit about people who are mentally ill, not so much dementia, because they weren't in that state before, but maybe somebody who has schizophrenia or some other mental illness. Mm -hmm. What do you see there? Well, so there, I have several patients with mental retardation, dementia, schizophrenia. I mean, it really does, to me, it doesn't matter. The, the brain's not working. They can't communicate. A dementia patient cannot communicate to me. But when God communicates and I'm holding them, it's a whole different level of communication. And they know because I know it. I feel it. I can see it in their body. And, and so Mrs. Campbell, I left her out, but I'll tell you, she was uh, a lady that had a big stroke on her left side and dementia, advanced dementia. And, um, you know, she wasn't. Living, she was going to die. So I put her on hospice and I came in and, and I, her, her left side's paralyzed. So I, I touched her on her left shoulder and for days she hadn't moved. So you'd agree that, that she's probably pretty far gone. Um, so she turns and opens her eyes and looks right at me. And I could feel this tremendous love flow through me. She reached up with her left arm, grabbed me by my arm here and her other arm, and she pulled herself up so she could look in, into my eyes, and then she smiled at me. And then she laid back down and rolled over, and the next day she died. So the illness, I don't think, matters, whether it's you know cancer, um, poison, um, dementia, multiple sclerosis, I don't think it matters. People know because they're communicating on a spiritual level. The body may not be able to, to respond, but I do believe um, I've seen it enough times that they, they, they know. And, and it's truly, you know, the, the chorus talks about the vision of Christ. It's, you're using different senses. So your human senses tell you one thing, but your spiritual senses will tell you another thing. I don't know if that helps. It, thank you. Uh, and I guess just to follow that, so is it the other people that are present, not seeing them as whole, that keeps them in these states? They because can. They can. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. They, they, can, they can be so upset, I'm not ready to let you go. There's so much trauma, unresolved guilt. Usually when I see that, there's been abuse, and there's guilt associated with that, and then the person dies, and they haven't had a chance to reconcile that. Now they're forced to do it. And they can't because the person's dead. They can't talk to them. And I'm like, nah, you can still talk to them. And it's actually easier to talk to them because you don't have the body to, to be interfered with. So, um, yeah, I know it's, um, I still pray for my mom. And, you know, we had some rough bumps there. But I can say, well, you were really a wounded person. I can still forgive and love. And now she's glowing because I can help her release her past. You see, so healing goes back. So, yeah. So that's where you have to look at it. Yeah. Over here. I hear what you're saying, that this is so important. I so agree with you that this is kind of important. I got involved after I experienced a whole series of losses myself. And I was, what do we do? How do we help? What do we do? And I went to a, uh, a 
gathering from the Tibet house. It was called On Death and Dying. And there's a whole group of people called thanatologists. And they, they're already working to help people. Some of them will go in and play instruments in the speed of their monitors. And as the person slows down, they slow down their music and they get slower and slower as their light goes out. There are animals that hang out in nursing homes that know when someone's going to die. And they go sit with them. And I'm a firm believer in God being present in animals big time. And so your work is so great and your work is so great and so important in this. I think there is a crying out amongst us all for we need to learn about this. We need to figure this out. This is too important just to slide by with. So there's a lot of things going on now, I think, about it. And thank you for your work, too. You've been talking about healing the past, but you said something, I don't remember what it was, that triggered the thought. Is there a way of healing into the future? Uh, that's for psychiatrists. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, uh, the times that I'm in that deep meditation, it's like you look all the way back and you can look all the way forward. And yes, I, my own experience is, is that that love flows both ways. It's far forward. Me, personally, if this is, this is the dream and I can shorten it by 10,000 years for humanity, that's what I'm going to do. And so there's still pain, painful issues in the past, you know, previous wars and things like that, things that need healing. And it's just that love just flows everywhere. It, 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 so I, I do think you can heal into the future. Um, and and the, even in the course, it talks about you can decrease time, you know, by forgiving thoughts. So if I can help you to unburden something, then, and it's not me doing this, by the way. It's just, I, I just sit there and look, and I just watch this flow. So, but I do, I do believe that that healing does occur. You know, let's keep in mind that uh, ultimately this has nothing to do with time. Right? I mean, the, the, when you, one of the things I want to do this fall is talk more about mystical experiences in relationship to the Course. One of them that, that uh, Rod has been referring to is the sense of knowing. It's kind of all-knowingness that comes across people who are having these experiences. Well, another one is that you, you completely step out of time because time is a story. You know, it's, and time is an ego story. Time is an ego's drama. And what the course is, this is, you know, this is, if I, the title is Eternity, <laughs> Eternal Life. So, you know, eternal life is nothing to do with time. If you look up the dictionary definition of eternity, it'll say it's, it's a place or state of timelessness. So all of a sudden, time is not even a factor here. It's just, it's what's happening now. Time becomes a factor uh, only in so hard like with the alcoholic. The guilt, you know, the guilt is the thing which holds us into the past, right? So it's healing that guilt, you know, freeing, freeing, getting free of the guilt. You know, one of the things that very often happens in deathbed experiences is that people will feel a need to confess. You know, they'll, 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 they'll have to get, they'll have to say something before they go, and then they, they tell all these, you know, these kind of deathbed, you know, un, unfaithfulness or whatever it was. They just have to get that out, right? <laughs> so, but that's letting go. That's healing it. That's healing the past. And the only problem with the f future is fear. So the fear is of what's going to happen, right? But the more that one can do what Rod is talking about, surrender to God, then there's no fear because there's just God there, and there's nothing to be afraid of. You know that you just think that there's something to be afraid of until you begin to have this experience of the, of the wholeness of God in your life. Uh, over here. My name is Aldo. Um, I just want to share something happened right now. Um, I have a friend right now. He's dying. Uh, we find out this 
just yesterday. Um, and they connected with me to, to see that, well, he's dying. He's, he has a stroke. And I came late because I went to see my doctor and I do an acupuncture. And at one moment I was just asking the Holy Spirit. And when I walk in here, I didn't know that you want to talk about this. <laughs> and we see you this morning. I mean, um, and through the table, when I was with the, with the needles, at one moment I say, where is the light in here? Uh, I, I want to connect with him. I don't know why, and I have the Holy Spirit. But this is a, a green light. I don't know if I'm all right, but it's open and closed. Uh, and um, um, I don't know. Um, at one moment, the whole thing goes into the center of the, I don't know, uh, just the center to connect it with him. And uh, I know very clearly he, he goes, uh, uh, he, he has a name for me. And it's, um, so I can hear his name telling me my name. <laughs> you know, it's just communication. Just this happened a few minutes ago. And uh, um, through the course of miracles, I ask, I say, what, what's going on in here? You know, well, I, I understand what's going on in there, but the connection, on, and, and you're right, there's no time and distance at all. And it's just, I had this experience. And soon I walk in here, you talk about the, the sparkle, the, light, the little light, and it's like, oh my God, what's going on in here? I mean, this is a beautiful thing, but I want to share this because it's just happening right now. This, my friend, is, we're growing up together. And he's dying. I mean, at, uh, uh, and he's in Mexico right now. And he's a doctor, too. So it is a very powerful family. And, uh, well, I just want to share that this happened. It's very good. Thank you. Remember, remember that um, in terms of A Course in Miracles, our basic function here and the way that healing occurs is through communication, right? And it's, it's the lack of communication that keeps us separate and divided and broken off from each other. And it, it's that makes us think that somebody else is wrong or bad, <laughs> you know, or needs to be fought against. You know, that's the insanity we've seen in our own country in this past week and this kind of division that seems to be there. But that division isn't really there. You know, that's just on the outside, and that's just the, the horrible external manifestation of it. There's another kind of thing that's really going on, which is what we really need to get to, which is to this kind of experience that you just had of connectedness. Right? So the, and it's the connectedness that's, that heals. Right? And there, there's a section in the Course where it says uh, God, or it doesn't use the word God, it says divine abstraction, uh, takes joy in sharing and what are we sharing? We're sharing, the sh what sh you're sharing is, is love. And, and it's the love that's healing. It's, it's, it's the, the Christ that's healing. So even to go to your question a moment ago, you know, it's really about just getting back to, you know, we're all healers. <laughs> and we all can be healers. The question is, how do we heal? Well, we, we heal through communicating and through connecting. But what we're connecting is on the love level. That's what we're sharing. We're not sharing that. We're not seeing the problem out there. The course draws this interesting distinction between Rod mentioned before, between projection. You know, projection is the problem. Projection is saying there is a problem. You're bad. You know, and and you're bad because you're black. How stupid! Can you? <laughs> or you're bad because you're white. <laughs> you know, or some silly thing like that. That's just only looking at the outside, and has no depth of perception at all, right? So the Course is saying that no, there's, there's another kind of, pro there is a kind of projection which is the right form of projection, and, and Rod talked about it a little bit, which is that we're extending love. It calls, it's called creation in A Course in Miracles. Creation is the process by which what we do is we extend love. So we, you do it, I do it, with, and you do it by studying things like A Course in Miracles, which helps to open, open your mind to this possibility so that you know how to get to this kind of peaceful place that Rod's been talking about here. And once you get to that peaceful place, then all kinds of healing can happen. So, I'm aware that Helen Shuckman um, had mystical experiences before the, she described the Course. 
Um, were, did you have any prior to your crash and burn um, experience? Mm -hmm. Could you talk about that? <laughs> uh, I don't mind talking. I don't mind talking about it. Um, but yeah, I, I had several mm -hmm. that that stood out. Um, they're just stories. Um, When I was really young, um, I, what's it called, astral projection? So I could do, the Moody Blues um, came out, dates me, um, but they had a song called Floating Among the Clouds. And I, I was sitting there listening to that and I'm thinking, I wonder if I can do that. And so I laid down on my bed and I just started dreaming, at least that's what I thought I was dreaming, that I was going among the clouds. Well, it turned out I'm starting to look down on my body in bed. And then I was able to take trips, um, short trips, and just float along and do different things. So I remember Paris very clearly, very <laughs> clearly. And I remember in what I was talking about being inside the sun. Well, to sit there and watch individual plasma atoms collide and give this off. So there's experiences like that. Um, I always see colors on people, um, auras, uh, red, green, and blue are the ones I see the most. And I've seen the auras of death. I've seen the auras, you know, of white. Um, so, I've, I've, you know, when you have something like that, you assume everybody can see it. I mean, it's, you can't see a blue aura. And look at that, you know. Um, and then I've had, um, I was flying my plane, my dad's airplane, once and um, I was doing stalls and the engine went out on me and I was going to call for help because my uh, dead engine it's not good and I'm flying over a city there's no place to land and, and Christ appeared right here and he said just put the microphone down he said peace something like feather the prop you will be safe which means pull back on the throttle so I did that and we flew back and the engine was sounded horrible. I could see the propeller going around, but he was just sitting there, oh, it's a delightful day to be flying, isn't it? <laughs> and, yeah. Um, and all the oil went out the bottom of the plane. So that, there is, and I have lots of stories like that. I don't, I don't want to belabor the point, but yeah. So hearing, seeing, and I've always had that. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think would be helpful to emphasize is that the kind of things that Rod is describing are really very much available to everyone, right? But it takes stopping the projection, first of all. I mean, stopping seeing all the problems in the world and, and stopping obsessing about all this. You've got to get to this peace place that he's talking about first before that can begin to happen. I think it's interesting that Rod was, was telling me, and you correct me if I get any of this wrong, that he would go to church on Sunday mornings, and but get kind of discouraged about going to church on Sunday mornings because everybody's walking up to him and says, "By the way, Doc, can you tell me? I got this little, you know," and, <laughs> and so he couldn't. Uh, it was like, he, well, <laughs> "Leave me alone." This is what he's thinking, right? So rather than doing that, he started meditating on Sunday mornings, right, and just doing a couple hours worth of meditation. And that became the real spiritual thing, you, <laughs> right? That was way, it's been fun for me for the past several years to, uh, not every week, but on occasional weeks, to open up the computer on Monday morning and get the description of Rod's uh, experience from Sunday. Yeah, as, but that's there, and it's so close, and it's so easy, and it's like, it's not very far away for anyone if you just... And that's what the Course is trying to help us do, is just to, to, to see this and to, to wake up. To it, We're right there. You know, we're right there. But just, it's just like the alcoholic. There's just this block. What was it saying in the first page of the Course of Miracles? That we're removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. It's just about removing these blocks. But it takes a willingness and some courage to, well, first of all, to take the, Meditate for two hours? <laughs> that seems stressful, right? And yet it's the most peaceful thing you can do. <laughs> Who else? Hello. Hello? 
I just have a quick question. My name is Antoinette. I'm at a turning point in my spiritual life, and I find great pleasure being by myself. And so, but I also have a very demanding life. How do you find the balance, especially, especially when you want to stay in bliss? How do you bring yourself to want to be normal and in your life? Yeah, that, that's, um, I write myself a work note. <laughs> Doctor's note, leave me alone. Um, <laughs> it's, I have to start my day reading from A Course in Miracles. I, I do a lesson or a section, but I always, it's a habit. I have to do it. And then I have to do a half hour. So I get up at 5.30 and everybody leave me alone, turn the phones off, and then I can get through the day. If I'm lucky around 6 o'clock, I can sit down for maybe 15, 20 minutes and, and meditate. I would love to have, be able to do this four times a day. But this guy's bleeding, this guy's dying, this one is constipated. And it's like, you know, <laughs> leave me alone. But it doesn't happen. So it's the best I can do. But that time is utilized very well by God. And it's, they're like, it's like an energy drink. It's very powerful. And that will carry me. And then, as I was saying earlier, I do, I do these little cards. I don't know if I got it with me. I think I do. These help tremendously. All I have to do is just put it in my pocket and touch it. And it's just like, oh, yeah. And all my cards, all my cards, less than 190, I choose the joy of God instead of pain. And I end all my cards and I rest in God. So, here. Thank you. I might add that I, I begin in the, every day the same way too, before turning on the computer or anything. Of, uh, that's very important, don't turn on the computer <laughs> because you could easily get distracted, right? Uh, just by reading the course, usually a workbook lesson, but it might be some part of it. And that, is, that has got to be so valuable. Now, it's kind of like a positive addiction. You know, it's a, a rewarding addiction to be able to do that before anything else happens in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Rod? I'm just blissed out. What did you say? Oh. <laughs> well, if there's no questions, we're turning it back to you. Oh. <laughs> Not exactly a question, but it might be a request, and it, I don't know if it's appropriate at this juncture, but I was just becoming aware of what happened to you when you were at the precipice of deciding to live or die, and the peace that you found, which was so astounding. I don't know if it would be okay to talk about it at this point. From, from, your, from your tape about mysticism, about what happened when, when you decided it was okay to go either way. You know, the, really the, the, the big problem, I think, in, in dying is, uh, well, first of all, it's fear. <laughs> you know, it, it's fear of letting go of this world and this body. And you, you have to get to a point where, where you say that's okay, right? And because... And then what's, that's a part of what the Course is teaching us. It's okay because, well, you're nobody in the first place. <laughs> you know, you have to get to this point where you really doesn't, you're not even here. I mean, that, that may sound strange, but you're not a body to start with. We have this great fear that somehow or another losing the body is going to mean that we're, we're goners. And the body dies for sure. Because you, but the Course in Miracles, you never were a body to start with, right? I love it when you're reading the Course and you come across one of these lines and you go, what? <laughs> and here's a really good what, which is, at, and not for a single second does a body exist at all. What? <laughs> not for a single second does it exist at all? It never did, and it never would, because it's a part of the dream. So what, what's really happening is that we're awakening from a dream, right? 
But you don't know that because the dream seems very, very real. Right? I mean, after all, these bodies uh, hurt. You know, if I, I punch you, you, you'll feel that. And, and yet, what's, the reason Jesus goes to a cross, in terms of the course, right, isn't vicarious salvation. He's not doing it for your sins, right? He's really doing it to show us that, first of all, he's not a body. And, and the body they can kill, but it doesn't make any difference because they cannot kill him. And the mind is the important thing. In terms of, or you can equate mind and spirit. They're really the same thing. That's what really matters. And so what we're trying to get back to here is back to spirit. As it is, we're very caught in the world and in the form and in the matter, and none of that makes matters. Right? We just try to we just make matter matter, which makes us matter. <laughs> well, that's really true. I mean, if you think about, again, this week, people get mad about the things that, that happen. And that's, that becomes the response. You know, we're going to go out there and kill them. That's what we're going to do. That's how we're going to solve the problem. Well, the truth of the matter is that that exacerbates the problem. And now somebody else is going to kill on top of the killing. And it just escalates the whole insanity. And at some point that has to stop. And the only place that that can stop is inside your mind. And it happens in your mind at the point at which you say, it's okay to let go. It's okay to die. Because dying is nothing. It's literally nothing. I mean, it's, it's no more than a kind of a, an awakening. I think one of the things that I think that's, that's going to happen with everyone when they die, is, well, for the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to have this thought, well, I'm still here. <laughs> Meaning, you, you you didn't go anywhere. You know, the, the, the body's gone, but the mind is not gone. And what, what matters if it's not the, the mind is the thing. Now, that, now, at that point, it's where the mind is at. And is the mind in fear? Is it in guilt? In which case, we need to do something like happened with Roger, because there has to be some sort of a, a process of forgiveness that we go through in order to find freedom. What the Course is saying is you can go through that process now. There's a saying from... Um, one of the medieval mystics, uh, those who die before they die don't die when they die. You know, so, so die now. You know, which I mean, th the sooner you can get let go of this insane fear of this, the thinking that this is all real, the easier it's going to be for you throughout this whole process. That's a part of what you're referring to. Anybody else? I think I think that. Um the way I look at that is to die all at once is, is a big jump. And um, it's better to die a little every day, you know, baby steps. And you become more peaceful. Every time you get upset about something, you add to the fear and the anger and the upset. And so if you learn to just say, that one's not going to bother me today, that one's not going to, to bother me today. And, and truly, at, at the end of my talk, I said, I rest in God. I am as God created me. The peace of God is more important to me than being right or winning this argument. Um, is it really worth getting this upset because somebody cut me off? And it's just like, now I just say to the egos, that's the best you can do. And um, play with it. I mean, you know, it's, uh, but it gets easier and easier and the thought of death, it doesn't bother me at all. Uh, it's just like, I'm going to lay down, and I'm going to be completely at peace. Um, so no matter what comes, if, if it's an accident or a heart attack or whatever, but um, the point is you're in control. You're the one that's making the decisions, and you can choose your reactions to all of this. So do a little bit every day. So in, in, in the use of denial, I, I mean, I just had my shoulder rebuilt about a week and a half ago, and, and I just chose not to have pain with it. And it's like, that's about, that's pretty, that's as far as I can go. Um, but the doctors are amazed. They said, you, you shouldn't be moving your shoulder. You know, and, and I said, I choose not to listen to you. You know, <laughs> well, I, doctors don't know what there's, anyway. 
<laughs> I'm a bad patient. <laughs> But the point is, you know, the doctor will tell me all these horrible things, and I can agree with that or I can disagree with it. And, you know, uh, for me, when I'm dealing with patients, they'll, they'll, they'll have this, like, pneumonia and, um, or an illness, and I'll, I'll look at them. He said, it's, it's just not that bad. I was expecting a lot worse. So I put a positive spin on it that, you know, you're actually going to get better sooner than I would expect. Most people take three weeks, you're going to be up and running in a week, easy. And it's those seeds of, of hope that I plant. And, and then I give my little magic pills, and this is a really strong antibiotic. It's all sales. It really is, you know. Um, but, but I can also do it the other way. And, you know, you've just gone through the windshield, and oh my God, this is really bad running a cardiac code, if, if I lose it, and, and you know you watch on TV, everybody's yelling and screaming and carrying on, my patient's gonna die 100%, guaranteed. And I walk in and, hmm, what's going on? Everybody calm down, take it easy, take a breath, do your job, and, and you know, uh, I, I win more than I lose. I've had a lot of close calls and good successes. So, but I decide ahead of time, like with the baby, if I would have panicked, I would have bought into the fear, I would have lost the child. But instead, I chose to step back and say, okay, I need help with this one. And that's all Christ needs. It's just, will you just be quiet a minute and let me help you? And I'll do everything for you. So. One of the workbook lessons in the course is I, I love waits on welcome, not on time. Just read that one this morning. Yeah. Just as an observation, uh, so what you're doing is practically go in and out of the source. I'm, I'm what? In and out from the source. Going in and out of the source? From the source. I mean, to uh, Christ energy you talk about. I mean, that's the thing. That's the practice. Correct. So you more in than out or yeah. out or in. You know what I'm trying to say, because yeah, yeah. the way I can feel you right now, you're more outside, and the, you're inside the source, which creates energy. Yeah, but I'm trying. It's, it's practice. I, as I said, I still fall down. People startle me, and, right. and, and I'll react. 10-pound uh -huh. weight falls on my foot, or I break my shoulder. I say lots of things. Because I have, I have the same problem. You know, I cannot move. supposed to not move my shoulder, I my back. I got a good surgeon for you. Oh, oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and if you die, I'll be there to help you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not supposed to move my shoulder too. And look at this. I'm, I turn. It's really bad. But but. But you, I can understand. The saying. more you do this, the more you relax, the more comfortable you get allowing Correct. this process right. to flow. The easier it gets. Because so, what I feel on you is that you're really more in the source. You're not really alive. I mean, you're alive, but you know what I'm trying to say. You come in. You use this body just to, to trans, yeah. You know, yeah. transmit from one point to another. Fluid, yeah. Right. So you are in between. Right. All right. Yeah, well, like all of us, but uh, yeah. you, you're more... You're more. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just got a... Just a line. It's just like some of us have reached a, a, a certain level without conceit, but reached a certain level. And I think that's in, in part what you're saying. Some of us are here when we're here and we're out when we're out. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know, because we move back and forth. We're on this, we're in the borderland. Right. Okay, it depends upon which way I'm blinking when I look at you. Mm. Welcome, thank you. And actually what you're doing here in this room is you have this experience of what they're talking about. There's something that, that pulls you here to know more about the in, right? What's really going on. Not in the world, not in politics, not on the outside. That's all chaos. That's all insanity. That's all a, a very strange dream that has always actually been going on. You know, but you can, play, you can play that game and you can be part of that, but that's just gonna make you go crazy. 
You know, the idea is to go, the Course is trying to help us to get, as you're, as you're saying, in, where, you, where the real sight can occur. He, uh, Rod was talking about sight earlier. You know, it's not, and, and <clears throat> the Course says, it's, it's not what your body's eyes see. You know, that's really important. It's not what's on the outside. It's not what your body's eyes see. It's what the inner eyes see, but you can't see this and do you things like meditation, studying, literally studying this, this, this material, etc. And then you do begin to see it, and you begin to get it. And what you, what you see is, first of all, there's nothing to be afraid of, including dying. <laughs> you know, including in the big one, or what most people would think is a big one. You know, letting go of the whole body. That's, that's, that's nothing. It's nothing. In fact, it's all the people who have near-death experiences universally come back and talk about these experiences. Well, Cora, who's not here today, but was a part of our, is often here, you know, has this experience of, of dying in, in an operation and did not want to come back. And she really did not, she was very upset with the, because they brought her back. <laughs> and she didn't want to. Now she's learning how to live in the world, even though she's really pretty much inside now. I mean, she's, she got it, she saw it in this experience, but now she's learning to live peacefully in the world, waiting for the time when she will really step out of it. And that's the same task for all of us. The task, though, the, the thing is to, is to get, do it now. You know, as I was saying that earlier, die before you die. You know, if, you, if you can do it now, if you can get to the peaceful place now, then it won't make any difference what, what's going on outside. And you don't even need to watch the news. <laughs> So, yeah, twice in, in some deep meditations, it is, it's such a lovely experience to float. And getting back into this body is like getting into a shoe that's two sizes too small. It's just like, oh, gosh, this hurts, then I'm hungry, and this is stiff. And twice um, I tried. I did not want to come back. It's truly that lovely, and I'm just, I'm all set. Thank you very much. And had to come back and, and once I felt the pressure on my shoulder and it's, you've got two boys that you're raising, oh, oh yeah. And, uh, and then again, there was another time I was out and I just really did, it's just so lovely to, to be in that state and um, deep peace and joy and I thought, I'm, all, I'm gonna stay here and again I had to come back and it's like, all right, so obviously when you come back, you've got unfinished business or God needs your help to, to do stuff like this and help people and, you know, so I've accepted that. The good news is then he starts to come into your life and you walk with God in perfect holiness. And it's like, well, I know you can't come here just yet, so I'll come to you. And now that's, that's quite a feeling. And, and to see that white light going to the nursing homes or in the grocery stores or somebody's cutting in front of you or some of these New York drivers. <laughs> you really scared me when you pulled out in front of that car. I just like... Anyway, but God comes to you and you start to have these mystical, holy experiences and they're truly wonderful that ties you over because they start to happen more and more frequently. There's a calmness that permeates your life. You're peaceful. Um, it takes a lot to rattle you and get you upset. And um, it's like, you know, I can live with this. I can, I can do this. And the thing that I really like um, is when somebody comes in into the ER, for example, and you see this tremendous fear and pain that they're dealing with. And their eyes, you always see it in their eyes. And you just come and hold their hand and, hi, I'm Dr. Chalberg, I'm here to help you, and this isn't so bad, this is what we're going to do. And they just immediately calm down and de-escalate. So it's just, it's just wonderful. So, yeah, I, I, I hear about people who have had death and dying experiences. The problem they have is they don't know how to bring God back with them. And so they're left with this huge hole. Um, I felt very depressed after one of these episodes, and it was, I was just like, how can I live and, and do this? And, and it was a matter of asking, it's like, all right, well, I'll come see you. So, you know, I, I come see John, and John comes see me, and it's like, well, that, that works. 
So, but to have God walk with you in this world and to feel that love and just radiate and watch everything scintillate and change and, and to feel that deep communication, that, that's pretty nice. So, and, it's, and those are moments, it's not continuous. I can't predict them, but they, they, they happen frequently enough that, that I'm very, very content with, with what I'm feeling. So it's, it's, it's pretty nice. So that's how I do it. If he didn't come visit me, it, it wouldn't be good. <laughs> It, it's just it's to have that kind of joy and come back to this kind of body with you know this is hurting and that's hurting is like for God's sake this body needs something every minute. I can't go more than thirty seconds without breathing. You know I mean that's pretty needy. Yeah. This is very interesting how you say this. Um, I feel like that you have a particle in you. You produce this particle, and it happens when somebody just is dying. Correct? Can you do that to anybody? I mean, talk about when you feel this energy or yeah. when somebody is in a very, um, I mean, ending, and he must be feel very vulnerable, uh, you feel that part, right? You feel that energy. So you had this, I call it the love of particle that you produce, mm. right? And you can put them on them. and. Uh, connected with infinite position of the particle, correct? Right. Well, um, can you do that to just any other person right here that, I mean, without even feel that they are in, in the vulnerable? I, I believe that each one of us in here, we are very vulnerable in that aspect. Uh, like right now, my friends and everybody is very vulnerable watching their own son or brother or sister dying. This is very important because when everybody's born the bomb and you had this particle, it's not just about who is dying. It's about the rest of the people who's around that. Right. So did you um, practice that and people who just like us are born the because we're here to figure out what's going on in here. You know? so it's a very doubt in here. And uh, I understand what you say. I not just understand, I can feel you that particle because I'm working on my own mm. feeling of peace. And since I'm a kid, I'm working on particles. But that's the way I see it. That's the way I feel it. Can you actually I, I use... do. I do. Um, I, I, f first, uh, on every, every meditation, I make it a point to cover the earth with love and to see the earth healed and whole and complete and just wash all that anger away. And what I see is just flashes of people flying by me. And then I can step back and see the earth healed and whole. So that, that's something I do with, with every meditation. It's, just, it's, part, it's part of my job, is just to help heal that. And the second is um, I, people will call me up and, and say, can you please help me with this problem? Um, so, uh, I will respond to them and and hold them in light in a meditation, and and it's not me. I, I just said, you know, God just put 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 the love there. Now sometimes there's a physical manifestation. Um, had a lady come in, and um, I wrote about this. It was I called it Ben the Dream. She had migraines, and. And I could see her outside of her body with my mind, her mind. And she held out this kind of like painful aura of, of, a, of a migraine. And I just pushed it out of the way with my mind. And the light flowed and, and, and she was healed. So that happens a couple of weeks ago. There was a lady who was having some visual problems. Another couple, I don't know, maybe half a year ago, Father and son just couldn't get along, and he asked for help. The love went out, and they sat down on a rock and just healed their relationship. And the third is um, I will be in the grocery store, and um, I touch people. You know, I, I just, you know, I, I just touch them. 
and and they and they always touch them on the shoulder and and they they just smile and like I don't know what you did but thank you you know and like I'm not on either <laughs> um, but I can feel that love flow and that's so whatever they needed mental spiritual or physical whatever something was healed and so it's just it's just the flow of love how it how it's how it flows is but those are my practices so so I, I just want to say I have a great respect for both of you because I think that this is this the stage that you set in asking that question is a really important one for us and but I would say that you know and I mean this with really with respect to ourselves is that I think we have to be very careful around idolatry and identifying another person as being the one who is because you, I'm sure, have just as much, you know, power to touch people in yeah. your life with a word, with a gesture, with, a, with something. And I think it's important that we recognize that. You know, this woman here is doing great work also. The janitor that's sweeping, you know, says a word to us and all of a sudden our, our worlds open up and our minds open up. So I do think that it's important that we recognize that even though the work that you're doing is extraordinary, it's on a level that only a few of us could imagine, but there are also things about our lives, however mundane or, you know, whatever they are, that we're really doing very similar things. Yeah. So that, I just wanted to say thank you to both of you because I think it really helps us to understand as individuals who we are and where we're situated and the fact that we are all miracle workers doing a very similar job. This is really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. There's a section on the course where it says, uh, you have, in essence, I'm paraphrasing, you have no idea how powerful your mind is. You know, it is so, and, and you're doing things actually all the time. Actually, I was with a friend a, a couple weeks ago, and we were going someplace, and um, it was about finding a parking place, right? And uh, so he found a parking place real quick, like, and he said, oh, Holy Spirit, help me find that parking place. I said, no, the Holy Spirit didn't have anything to do with it. You did that. And he kind of got it, you know, that, that actually he had. <laughs> do you understand? Thank you for coming, first of all. Um, my name's Robert. Um, getting a lot of insights listening to you, because there's, there's other people here that are medical professionals, but um, what I'm learning by listening to you is that um, the biggest opportunity we have is to be conduits of love, um, God's love, and to give our ego. But how, I have two questions. One, you know, being doctors, surgeons have big egos. How to, or, or in my line, the paramedics, or the paramedic instructors that think they're it because they got the drugs to push to save people's lives. How can we get through to them, uh, you know, better? A surgeon? Oh, that, <laughs> impossible. Probably impo I mean, I've been in operating rooms, too, and I've seen, you know, to, to be in a position, have a scalpel, and, yeah. and do the transaction. <laughs> well, don't feel bad. I, you know, as an ER doc, I, oh, God, I just call on a surgeon to tell him that someone's got a broken hip. It's just, why are you calling me? And, um... So the best I do, because um, there are certain that are really difficult, and well, I should, no, I'm not going to tell you that story. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm not a... <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm just thinking about liability here. Um, <laughs> no, but the, you know, the, the best thing to do is to relax. And, you know, you hear this guy's got this reputation. You know, we've got a few doctors like that. And nobody wants to bring them to the ER because this doctor is working or that doctor is working. And the best thing that I find is not to engage because the first thing they do is, hello. And, and I'm always, I go extra nice, extra pleasant. And that's a buffer for me that, that there's more niceness in there. So, and the second thing I do is I decide they are not going to get to me. I, I just, you know, you can say all the bad things you want. Um, but you're not going to get to me. And then, and then the third thing is, um, you know, Christ, you have to go ahead of me. So, you know, you're in your rig doing your thing, calling in your, your information, and just let, 
just imagine somebody that loves you so much. I'm going to go there. I'm going to talk to him first. You know, just say that's that's what you that's how powerful you are. So it's like, all right, so and so is working. I'm not going to react to him. You know, um, I'm going to be extra nice. I'm going to buffer myself because it's not my problem, even though he's trying to make it your problem. Mm. You know, um, and then, and then third is ask Christ. So, an orthopedic surgeon who's known for temper issues was called by me early in the morning for a lady, and I'm not using names so I can say this, but <laughs> uh, he, he called and he says, well, why are you calling me at two in the morning? I said, we just deliberately went out, threw this lady down, broke her hip just to piss you off. Wake you up. <laughs> <laughs> it was very satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. The, the second is um, I, I'm in the same circumstances I have, like two people around me and one that I knew when I was a kid and I re-met him and I've been friends with him, coming more friendly, dying and really afraid of death. I'm not the type of guy that you would think would be afraid of death. Tough guy, uh, Skywalker and all was. And, um, and, I'm, and his ego was... You know, he, he'll throw stuff at me or other people and the anger. and um, I'm having a hard time. I, I think I was sent there to meet him and not about my ego, but I'm trying to figure out how I can help him transition. So is he still alive? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And he's alive and kicking. You know, he's tough. I mean, he's had multiple falls from buildings and cancer three times in his time. He fell just before. He was all broken up. Mm -hmm. So he couldn't go for the, for the treatments. And he's about two years older than me. He's uh, 57, going to be 58. Yeah. And, um, but he's, he's afraid of death. And he's yeah. the type of guy that you wouldn't think would be afraid. Right. Well, yeah, that's a very primitive fear that's coming out. And first of all, you know, is hospice involved with him? Not yet. He's running around. He's doing everything, trying to um, yeah. justify to stay alive. He was in a hospital for about two weeks. And... He signed him, you know, I shouldn't be really talking, but he signed himself out. Yeah. You know, his doc was like, oh, you can a stay. Lot of, a lot of denial. Yeah. Yeah. So um, sometimes it's better, you're too close. It's better to get hospice involved, you know, um, and, and because you're, you're trying to help him, but you're also trying to be the friend, and sometimes that's a conflict. Yeah. And so if you get a third party, they will take the heat, so to speak, and help you with that. He has a family member that's working with him, but he's still running around doing his thing. But, hosp I, but hospice, and I, yeah. hospice is good for six months. And it's like, you know, let's just talk about it. He might not be ready for it. Um, it doesn't doesn't sound like it. No. So then all you can do is, is relax into it and, and be the friend. And again, in all these problems in our lives, if we just ask for help, there's so much help available for you. You know, why, why should you shoulder this? You know, I read, I am caressed by love. God loves you that much that he will help you. Um, so you're trying to do it yourself. You I don't can't. have to. Yeah, I know it's I can't. It's too big. Yeah. And his ego is too strong and the fear is too strong. All right, brother, take over and, and help me with this. And so you, at bedtime, you go to sleep, you, you see the love that's going in the morning when you wake up, you know, you're, those are my first thoughts is what should I do to help people today? What, what can I do to be of service? And, um, and it, I think you're going to be very surprised by asking for help, you know, because you're going to be blessed by it too. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. This certainly sets off a lot for me. Um, and I'm sure for the rest of you, wouldn't you agree? Am I alone? <laughs> he says, yes, I am. Okay. L look, it's, a, it's, um, it's an incredible situation what's going on here about, we're really talking about life and death issues and the fear, the fear, and what can I do about it? You know, as if I'm going to stop the process of... Uh, the inevitability, 
And I think doctors have colossal egos where it comes to that. Look, I saved a life. From what? The Course says, from what? The Course also says, I will step back and let him lead the way. You know, to get in touch with the fact that you may not hear that voice, but you can at least step back and then see what happens. Because if you connect with Holy Spirit, and the Course says this explicitly, you will not be denied. So the fact of the matter is, it's a discipline. The discipline of, I can do it. I'm strong. Or I'm so scared, I'm doubtful, so I don't know exactly what to do. You know where you're at. The ego stands in the way, right clearly in the way of your allowing spirit to take over. Check it out. You'll see it's, it's there in black and white many, many times in the Course. So what's there to be afraid of? I need do nothing, it says. I don't got to do a thing except step back and let him lead the way. Try it. More than once. Don't give up. Here, Jeff. Is this on? Okay. Uh, this is an observation. Um, I've experienced the passing of both parents. And when my dad passed, I was a teenager. And it wasn't the greatest relationship in the world. And it was, had some anger and so forth. Um, but the long and the short of it is that I, it took me a long time to forgive myself and to forgive him. Um, and there was a lot of grief that, and you know, guilt that went along with it. Um, Fast forward to about a year and a half ago when my mom, I had been studying the course, not coincidentally, for a little while. And um, it was her time to pass, it felt. Um, she had dementia. When you mentioned that, that really hit home. Um, and a, a few other things. Um, and before she did go into hospice, it was about a week or so before, I remember visiting her in the hospital one of the, the final times. And I had this... It was, it, I don't know whether it was a voice or whatever you'd want to call it. It was an inner knowing of, I looked down at her and I said, I, I just knew that this is not you. You know, you, this withered body laying in this hospital bed is just not what you are. It's not your essence. It's just not you. And then I became very, very calm. And um, I just knew it. It just, no, nobody could tell me. I, I just knew that that was the reality with a capital R. And it saved me a ton of grief, a ton of stuff. So uh, I don't know if it saved me a thousand years, but it felt like it. So, very interesting. May I, may I share something? Um, I just want to respond to you, sir, in the, in the corner about the healing of people. I have worked in major medical centers for years with doctors and nurses and all of the staff. And some of the most powerful and healing people were the people who came in at about 11 o'clock at night and swept the floor. So it's there. And the second thing that I just, is a question, is um, not studying A Course of Miracles yet. My understanding of this life's journey is to actually get to that place while we're alive, while we're living, that we're living in love and light and, and in complete parallel with God's source. Is that correct? You know, it's, it's very helpful. I see some hands over there. You've got to get a sec. It's very helpful to talk about what life is, okay? And we have this sort of strange, it's like, again, what's happened this week? People lost their lives. Well, the bodies disappeared, yeah. But the Course says life, I'm quoting directly from the Course now, right? Life does not begin with the birth of a body. Life does not end with the death of a body. So it neither begins with the birth nor does it end with a birth, right? And it also says that God is life, right? So what Rod is, is doing here, he's talking about getting in touch with life, you know, which we call God, you know, or, or energy, or force, or, you know, power. It's, it's, it's this thing that really is running the show, which has nothing to do with 
the outside show, you know, the, the circus of the world, but it's heaven, right? And that's where God is. I mean, that's sort of one of the definitions. And, and again, in terms of the Course in Miracles, the Course is saying, actually, we're all in heaven. But it doesn't look like it. <laughs> you know, it looks like we're dreaming this crazy dream in which we think that we're trapped uh, for a time inside these bodies, inside this world, inside this particular space, all of which is not true, and you become aware of the fact that it's not true. One of the ways you become aware of the fact that it's not true is A, by doing this kind of work and doing this kind of study and this kind of meditation. But then there's also this interesting event which occurs is when we step out of the bodies, which is sort of an interesting... But, but life is still there. Life is a constant and cannot be lost. So there's some hands over here. And Nancy behind you, or you, you have a hand yourself. Yeah. Okay, so you start with you. Um, I, I want to take us back to a philosophical question for both of you. Um, in the course, it says something to the effect, and I'm probably not quoting directly from the course, um, but there is something that says we need to be the hands of God. It's part of our purpose here because God is a force of love. Mm -hmm. And it's our job to translate that love into whatever circumstance we find ourselves. Is that correct? And saying. so all of us, I mean, it kind of gets back to what you were saying before, that all of us are acting out our goodness, mm -hmm. God's goodness, through ourselves as much as we can. And so it's, I mean, this is a great example that you're giving us of how you're doing it. And I really appreciate you sharing how you get there. You know, the meditation you do, the time you take during the day, you know, your notes in your pockets, the little clues for us, the breadcrumbs that we can follow for ourselves of reorienting ourselves back to that purpose and understanding that our purpose isn't going to be your purpose. It's going to be our purpose, but still it's similar. And I always see that with healing people. I mean, there's amazing healers out there. They might be the nurse or the nurse's aide or, you know, somebody that doesn't have a big title they might be the most healing person on that floor. You know, they're people that are just tuned into the love. And the same thing for all of us as we're going through our mm -hmm. life. That's yeah. what we're called to do, right? Mm -hmm. To be the love. Be the love. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Rod, for coming down. And, and I appreciate your your public uh, speaking in front of YouTube, uh, being a doctor and doing all that. Um, but a question I had for John was, I, I've, uh, you know, I've been here three years with John, and, and, uh, but I read his stuff before I, I came here, and you know, I knew about his, uh, his uh, cancer situations, and, and in his last book he spoke of it, it seemed very clear to me his, uh, the emphasis was on this experience he had early on in his life where he uh, was in the, for lack of another word, the jungle, and he, he, he had this uh, out-of-body experience. And that the only, the, the, the Course in Miracles was a, a method to, to, uh, uh, to uh, give meaning to that experience. And, and I've always wondered, like, you know, since I've read it and I've read other books of yours, the, the, uh, but this last book seems to be focused on that as, as meaningful. And is that your, John, is that sort of like an idea that you have of, of what heaven may be like on the other side, you know, or what an alternate reality other than our walk in the earth in, in our ego-centered universe? Here, one of the uh, workbook lessons is uh, heaven is a decision I must make, right? 
So uh, that's actually a friend of mine made a song, uh, heaven is a decision, I mean, it's a chant, right? Heaven is a decision, I, and that's true. Uh, heaven is a decision we all must make. So the question remains one of when, I, when do I make that decision, right? And of course also it says heaven is here and heaven is now, right? And then there's another line where it says, why wait for heaven? So if heaven is a decision I must make, heaven is here and heaven is now, and why wait for heaven? <laughs> then I might as well go ahead and make that decision right now. And I make that decision right now by coming from love rather than projecting attack onto the world. I mean, I, mean, I stopped stopping the insanity inside of me. Okay? That's true for all of us. So as I stop the insanity, then what I see is peace. And, and I become peaceful. And as I become peaceful, it becomes easier for me to, to share that peace as a, as a means of healing, which is a, you know, and that's a wonderful function. You know, it's a wonderful, that's, and that's the same job we've all got. We've all got the same job of just extending this love and getting out of our own way, removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, which suddenly makes this possible. It's a really good job. You know, <laughs> and we've all got the same job. And you, you, you apply this job in every encounter you make with every human being. So you're not attacking them. You're, you're seeing the innocence and the wholeness that's inside there. It takes practice, so as Shanti and others have said. It really takes practice because we've been, the Course says, very poorly taught. You know, we were taught something very different. And the world continues to teach insanity. You know, our, our, our task is not to buy into that teaching of the insanity of the world, because it would be really easy to do that. All right. um, I want to, we're, we're near the end, and I want to do a little meditation, but first of all, uh, I want to say, Raj, you got any parting uh, words for us? You know, yeah, yeah I rest in God. Let it go. Stop worrying so much. He's right there. He loves you. He's going to help you. Just let it go and trust that he's going to take care of you. That's my parting words. Your shoulders out? Oh. My shoulders in. Um, I think that's been your message all evening. And that's what I'm taking away, and I want to thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. I've been wanting to bring Rod down from uh, Maine for a long time to be with you and to have this sh to share this experience. I've been kind of selfishly getting to know Rod better all the time. and mm. So nice to share with good friends. And thank you, Diane, for coming along. So what I'd like to do is a little meditation. By the way, after the meditation, um, there, we go out to dinner for whoever would like to join us. It's a place called uh, Saigon Market. It's on University Place. It's just two blocks directly uh, down 12th Street. And then you make a left, and it's there, and they already have uh, table reserved for us. And if you get there before we will, because we'll probably be kind of closing up here, uh, just say you're with the Miracles Group, and they'll show you to where we'll be. So for those of who wish to join us, who can. And thank you for uh, several of you again, for really, like again, like, like Alex and Billy and, and so many of you who went through this whole 31 chapters of the, the Course in Miracles with us. And I think that uh, the little shift we're going to make in the fall is going to be really exciting as well. And again, the next meeting will be, uh, well, it's easy to remember 9-11, right? Okay. And yeah, we don't have to, but um, Michael, can you just dim the lights a little bit? Not all the way down, because I want to be able to see what I'm going to share here. You're in the right place. You just should be able to turn those knobs. Oh, yeah, that's, you're getting it. That's good.
and maybe a little bit more. Okay, so this is lesson 199 from A Course in Miracles, and uh, I'm going to read a part, and then I'm going to say, say with me. And when I say the phrase, say with me, and then what you're going to say is, I am not a body, I am free. Okay? So let's just close our eyes and relax, get comfortable, and be very present, because there's no place else to be right now. I am not a body, I am free. Freedom must be impossible as long as you perceive yourself as a body. The body is a limit. Who would seek for freedom in a body looks for it where it cannot be found? The mind can be made free when it no longer sees itself as a body, firmly tied to it, and sheltered by its presence. If this were the truth, the mind were vulnerable indeed. Say with me, I am not a body, I am free. The mind that serves the Holy Spirit is unlimited forever in all ways, beyond the laws of time and space, unbounded by any preconception, and with strength and power to do whatever it is asked. Attack thoughts cannot enter in such a mind because it has been given to the source of love, and fear can never enter in a mind that has attached itself to love. It rests in God. And who can be afraid who lives in innocence and only love? Say with me, I am not a body, I am free. Be not concerned that to the ego it is quite insane. The ego holds the body dear because it dwells in it and lives united with the home that it has made. It is a part of the illusion that has sheltered it from being found illusory itself. Say with me, I am not a body, I am free. Declare your innocence and you are free. The body appears because you have no need of it except the need the Holy Spirit sees. For this the body will appear as useful form for what the mind must do. It thus becomes a vehicle which helps forgiveness be extended to all inclusive goal that it must reach according to God's plan. Say with me, I am not a body, I am free. Be free today and carry freedom as your gift to those who still believe they are enslaved within a body. Be you free so that the Holy Spirit can make use of your escape from bondage to set free the many who perceive themselves as bound and helpless and afraid. Let love replace their fears through you. Accept salvation now and give your mind to him who calls to you to make this gift to him. For he would give you perfect freedom perfect joy and hope that finds its full accomplishment in God. Say with me, I am not a body, I am free. You are God's son. In the mortality, you live forever. Would you not return your mind to this? Then practice well the thought the Holy Spirit gives you. Your brother stands released with you in it. The world is blessed along with you. God's Son will weep no more, and heaven offers thanks for the increase of joy you practice brings to it. And God himself extends his love and happiness each time you say, I am not a body, I am free. Hear the voice that God has given me, 
and is only this my mind obeys. Amen. Amen. See you in September. Thank you. Thank you.